Mrs. Fernandi here, ready for chapter seven of Chasing Vermeer by Blue Valiant. Chapter seven, I mean chapter six, my goodness, chapter six, sorry. It's called The Geographer's Box, and in my book it starts on page 50. Ready to read along? On the day Miss Hussey gay, had given the art assignment, Calder went straight up to his room after school. He sat down at his desk and pulled out his pentominoes. The W fit with the Y and the U, and the I slid in agreeably next to the L. The X was difficult to work with in work into the rectangle, but it might fit here between the P and the U. Pentominoes always helped him think. He wrote down the word art. He followed it quickly with RTA, RAT, ATR, TRA. It wasn't what he'd meant to put on his list, but his pencil kind of took charge. He read what he'd written aloud. It was a tongue twister, he noticed with delight, aside from being almost every combination of A-R-T. Calder shook himself back toward the assignment. Was this his weird list a piece of art? How about the old fashioned kind of art? the kind in museums that turned up on postcards and posters in people's kitchens, the kind that he, they'd been talking about in school today. Miss Hussey was always saying, listen to your own thinking. Well, what if he, and not those museum people, was the one to decide what was wonderful to look at? What would he choose? The same stuff that was now famous? Probably not the French lady with the too small dress. Art for him was something puzzling. Yes, something that gave his mind a new idea to spin around. Something that gave him a fresh way of seeing things each time he looked at it. What was he remembering? He crawled under his bed and dragged out a dusty crate filled with green army men. He dug down into the corner and pulled out a small box. Calder held the box carefully in both hands. It was made of a dark wood and the corners were covered with inlaid silver vines. The painting on the top showed a man with a ponytail length hair leaning over a table. He was dressed in a fancy bathrobe and his face was turned thoughtfully toward a window. A tool that resembled a compass was held lightly in his right hand. A large roll of paper lay under his right arm. There was a wrinkled oriental rug bunched up in the, on the corner of the table in front of him, and his left hand rested on what appeared to be a book. His expression looked as though he'd been thinking important thoughts, and something had, just in that moment, interrupted him. Calder felt a sense of understanding, of sympathy for this man. This was what he felt like when he suddenly had to pay attention to school in school. Calder had always loved this picture. Reaching for his magnifying glass, he held it over the top of the box. He saw light sparkle from the old glass in the window, and the rug came alive with blues and warm golden tones. On the tall cupboard was, the, was written the word mirror. 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 He rolled the word around in his mind. He wished Grandma Ranjana had told him more. He tried to remember exactly what she had, when she had given him the box. He had been small enough to sit on her lap and play with her reading glasses. He might have been four or five. He could remember her blue velvet rocker, the cracks on her knuckles, her gentle cheeks the color of dark chocolate. Grandma Ranjana had loved puzzles and mysteries and would have approved of Mrs. H Ms. Hussey. Calder grabbed the box and ran, rushed downstairs. He would take a rainbow bath, as Grandma Ranjana used to call it. On late afternoons in the fall, the sun came through the leaded glass window in the Pile's living room and threw rainbows and wavery rhombi and polygons on the floor, the walls, the backs of chairs and sofas. This parade of soft color traveled slowly up one side of the room and vanished in the corner of the ceiling. Grandma Ranjana always swore that sitting in geometry helped the brain. Calder began to write. The man in my hand looks toward the window and the light lands on one arm and one cheek and the paper on his table. You know the way paper gets blinding in bright light? Well, this paper almost makes you squint. The colors around him are blue and red and light brown. A scrunched up rug is on the edge of the table between him and me as if someone tossed it up there when they were cleaning the floor and forgot to put it back. 
And now for weight and size. This thing is about as heavy as a bag of chocolate chip cookies, or maybe an empty spaghetti sauce jar, or a large t-shirt. It is about as thick as a dictionary and as long as a medium tube of toothpaste. Calder paused, the box in his right hand, and looked at the windows of the rainbows floating on the far wall. He realized with a shiver of pleasure that the afternoon light was landing on his body in a way that was similar to the fall of light in the picture. And he wondered if he also looked like he was thinking great thoughts. He was interrupted by loud voices outside the front window. When he peered out, he saw Miss Hussey and Mr. Watch, his boss from Powell's. What on earth were they doing? And then Calder noticed an old lady sitting on the ground between them. When he opened his front door, Miss Husby shouted, Water! Get some water! By the time he was back with a glass, the old lady was standing. Calder didn't recognize her. Miss Hussey said, Thanks, Calder. I didn't know you lived right here. She explained what Mr. Watch had just told her. He usually walked to Mrs. Sharp to Powell's once a week to pick out some books. Miss Hussey had happened to be just behind them. She'd seen Mrs. Sharp stumble and sink to the curb. Mr. Watch looked embarrassed. Miss Sharp looked irritated. What would I need water for? She snapped. Stupid, these, stu these new shoes. A grasshopper couldn't walk in them. Was she calling Miss Hussey stupid? If so, Miss Hussey didn't seem to notice. She offered Mrs. Sharp her arm. Calder went back inside and watched from his front window until he couldn't see the three of them anymore. That evening, Calder got a letter. Ripping it open, he grinned. Who else? And look at that. That is some seriously cool code. Oh, whoops. Who do you think the letter's from? I think it's probably from his friend Tommy, right? He hurried up to his room to dig out the pentomino code that he'd made for himself and Tommy before his friend left. And if you look here, you see that if it says one F, that's the letter A. If it says two, I don't know, two L, that's the letter O. So it's a very cool code and you could pause here and you could see if you can figure out what has been said. Calder decoded the message. Worried, he went down to the kitchen to tell his parents the news. Everyone in the Pillay household felt bad. Moving to a new neighborhood was hard enough, but having the kid next door suddenly disappeared, disappear seemed like a bad joke. Tommy had never known his real father. During the past winter, his mom, Zelda, who worked in the university library, took a vacation with two other women. They went to Bermuda. She came back with a husband. At first, Tommy was very quiet and didn't want to talk about old Fred, as he started calling him. Fred tried hard to be a dad. He played baseball with Tommy in the park. He came to school and met many of the teachers. He took Tommy and Calder to 53rd Street for hot fudge sundaes all the time and let them get any size they wanted. After a while, it seemed like Tommy was starting to like him. And then old Fred announced last July 4th. Calder remembered the date because it took the bang right out of the fireworks, that the family would need to move to New York. He had bought a house in the suburbs without even telling Tommy's mom. And of course, not the kid, Tommy had said when telling Calder. And now this frog business, what kind of name was frog anyway? Calder wrote Tommy right back. And then you can figure out that one too. We should pause and figure it out. Tommy had always liked spying. Maybe this was an opportunity not to be a mediocre kid. Calder smiled, remembering their conversation in the kitchen when he had first gotten his pentominoes. He hoped his message would help. After writing the letter and sealing the envelope, it occurred to Calder that maybe this was bad advice. What if something horrible really had happened to the kid next door? Whoever was responsible wouldn't want another kid snooping around. Calder's parents had told him that the chances of it being a real kidnapping were small. He hoped they were right. I want you to try to figure out those letters. The letter from, we know something has happened to the boy next door, that'll help. But if you think about this last part right here, it's gonna be the name, right? So see if you can figure out before you watch the next video and I'll see if I can figure it out too. Okay, see you next time.